Hi everyone, this lesson is on age-related macular degeneration or AMD. In this lesson, we're going to talk about some of the risk factors for getting this condition. We're also gonna go into some of the pathophysiology behind why it occurs. And then we're gonna talk about the signs and symptoms, how it's diagnosed and how it's treated. So age-related macular degeneration is an ocular condition involving degeneration of the macula. So the macula is actually part of the back of the eye. It is part of the retina. And it is an area that contains a high concentration of cones, which are the light sensitive photoreceptors in the retina. And the macula itself is involved in and facilitates central vision. So when looking at an object in the center of your vision, that is being mediated by the macula. The macula also contains the fovea, which has the highest concentration of cones. So the fovea is involved when you focus on a particular object to actually see the most detail of that object. There are actually two types of AMD. One is dry macular degeneration and the other one is wet macular degeneration. We're gonna talk about both of these and how they are both treated differently later on in this lesson. Macular degeneration is actually the most common cause of blindness in the Western world. The incidence of this condition increases exponentially after the age of 50. So each decade after the age of 50, the percentage of incidence of this condition increases rapidly. This leads us into the risk factors for getting this condition. By far, one of the most important risk factors is increasing age. We talked about increasing age leading to an exponential rise in the risk of acquiring this condition. Being of Caucasian ethnicity is also another risk factor for getting age-related macular degeneration. Having blue-colored eyes is another risk factor. Having a family history of this condition, particularly if you have a first-degree relative, such as a parent that has this condition, you're at a higher risk for also getting this condition. Smoking is another risk factor, along with alcohol consumption. Hypertension or high blood pressure can also be another risk factor, and obesity and diabetes can be a risk factor as well. And then we can see that increased sun exposure can also increase the risk for age-related macular degeneration later on in life. Let's talk about the types of age-related macular degeneration. We talked about the two types, dry and wet. We're gonna talk about a brief summary of the pathophysiology behind both of these types of macular degeneration. So we're going to only talk about some of the broad strokes of the pathophysiology. We're not gonna get into all the minute detail. But before we do that, we have to talk about some eye anatomy. So if we look at the back of the eye, the back of the eye contains the retina, the light sensitive layer that translates light into visual images for our brains to interpret. But when we look at the back of the eye, there is actually multiple layers of complexity in the eye. For one, we have the choriocapillaris. And then there is what is known as the Brooks membrane or Brux membrane that actually contains five layers. And we're not going to get into all these layers, but this membrane is going to be very important with regards to the pathophysiology of this condition. And Brux membrane actually separates the choriocapillaris, which is blood capillaries. It separates it from the retinal pigment epithelium and the rods and the cones. Now, the first type we're going to talk about is dry age-related macular degeneration. This is also known as non-exudative AMD. This is also known as non-neovascular. So that means that there's not going to be new formation of vascular tissue or no new formation of new arteries or veins. This is actually the most common type of macular degeneration. It accounts for more than 90% of cases. This is actually a slowly progressive condition. The progression may take decades. However, this type of age-related macular degeneration can progress into the wet type, and we're going to talk about that in the next slide. So what can happen in the dry type is that there can be Bruch membrane thickening. So this membrane we just talked about here can thicken, mostly due to what are known as drusen that form and accumulate between the Bruch membrane and the retinal pigment epithelium. So drusen are these yellowish or white-colored deposits of oftentimes lipids and proteins. So these will form and begin to accumulate within the space between Brooks membrane and the retinal pigment epithelium. This can ultimately lead to retinal atrophy and ultimately cause central retinal degeneration. Now let's talk about the wet type. Wet age-related macular degeneration is also known as exudative AMD. And it is also referred to as neovascular AMD because it involves new formation 
of new blood vessels. So neo meaning new and vascular referring to blood vessels. And the wet type, as we mentioned before, is going to be the more rare type. It's going to affect approximately 10% of individuals who have macular degeneration. This actually progresses faster than the dry type. It progresses over months compared to the dry type that progresses over decades. And what happens here is that the accumulated drusen causes breaks in the Brooks membrane. And what happens is there is a particular isoform of vascular endothelial growth factor or VEGF that accumulates in this area. This is isoform 165. This leads to choroidal neovascularization or CNV. This is where there is new formation of new blood vessels. The problem is, is that these new blood vessels are going to be weaker and more fragile than other blood vessels. What can also happen is that the choriocapillaris can cross the Brooks membrane. So it can cross past that membrane. Because of the weak nature of the new blood vessels, there can be leakage of proteins and fluid. There can be fluid accumulation within the membrane causing edema. And then overall, this may lead to a detachment of the overlying retinal pigment epithelium. So all of that fluid building up in that space can lead to a detachment. There can also be hemorrhage of those weak and floppy blood vessels as well. So that would be something that can also occur. And then there can be scarring in that area that can also lead to issues with macular functioning. So all of this, again, is just a brief overview of the mechanism as to how both dry and wet macular degeneration occur. Now let's talk about the signs and symptoms of this condition. Because the macula is affected, the macula is involved in central vision. So there's going to be a loss of central vision. And this is going to be progressive in nature. So as time goes on, the central vision loss becomes worse and worse. We mentioned this earlier, but again, there's going to be a slower progression in dry macular degeneration compared to wet macular degeneration. There's a more rapid progressive loss of central vision in wet age-related macular degeneration. And then this is also going to affect the ability to perform tasks that require focusing. We talked about the fovea being very important in the ability to focus on very small objects. And because the fovea is contained within the macula, this can lead to issues with performing tasks that require focusing, including reading. So trying to look at letters and numbers can be very challenging. Driving can also be affected as well. And recognizing faces can also be an issue because you're focusing on the face. There can also be reduced night vision that can occur in some patients. And there can be reduced light adjustment as well. And there can be fluctuating vision in some patients. There's also a very hallmark finding in this condition that is called metamorphopsia. Metamorphopsia is the term used for distorted lines and shapes. So when you look at an Amsler grid, we're going to talk about this later on, the Amsler grid has lines that cross and form boxes with all angles at 90 degrees. With metamorphopsia, because of the degeneration of the macula, when you're trying to focus on the Amsler grid, the boxes and the lines and the shapes can all be distorted. So we can see a pattern like this. And when you're looking at other objects with lines and shapes, they can be distorted as well. So this can be a finding with age-related macular degeneration as well. And there's also a condition that can be associated with age-related macular degeneration. This is called Charles Bonnet or Charles Bonnet syndrome. This is actually where the loss of the input from the macula can be interpreted by the brain to cause visual hallucinations. So this can occur in some patients with this condition as well. Roughly 10% of patients who have macular degeneration will experience Charles Bonnet syndrome. So how do clinicians diagnose macular degeneration? Oftentimes a fundoscopic examination may be performed. If we look in this image here, here is the optic nerve and located on the temporal side of the optic nerve is the macula. And you can see in this image here, there are yellowish whitish deposits in and around the macula, and these are drusen. And in a more severe case, you can see the drusen has begun to spread to other areas as well. So seeing drusen, these yellow white deposits can be a sign of macular degeneration. Now there are actually four groups of severity of age-related macular degeneration. And these four groups come from the age-related eye disease study or AREDS. So the first group is group one, where there is up to five to 15 small drusen. And small is defined as less than 63 microns in diameter. And these drusen occur in the absence of any other stage of age-related macular degeneration. 
The second would be referred to as early stage age-related macular degeneration. This is where there are more than 15 small drusen or less than 20 medium-sized drusen. Medium-sized is defined as 63 to 124 microns in diameter. And in this stage, there is no geographic atrophy. In the third group, this is referred to as the intermediate stage. So this stage involves at least one large drus, which is defined as greater than 125 microns in diameter, or 20 or more medium-sized drusen or non-central geographic atrophy, which means that the atrophy does not involve the fovea. And then group four is the advanced stage. This is where there is central geographic atrophy, so atrophy involving the fovea, or there is presence of neovascular age-related macular degeneration. If there is neovascular or wet macular degeneration, this is considered an advanced stage. Diagnosis can also be performed using the Amsler grid. So the Amsler grid, again, is that grid we talked about before. It'll look distorted. There'll be metamorphopsia present. And this can be used in early stages to assess the progression of macular degeneration, so it can be used for self-assessment over time. Some other ways to diagnose age-related macular degeneration is fluorescein angiography and ocular coherence tomography, or OCT. How do clinicians treat macular degeneration? The treatment is going to be split up between dry and wet macular degeneration. With regards to dry age-related macular degeneration, oftentimes the early Age-related macular degeneration requires no intervention, but annual assessments are very important. We talked about this type being a type that slowly progresses, but it's still important to assess it periodically. It's also important to stop smoking. So we talked about smoking and even alcohol consumption as being risk factors for getting macular degeneration. So it's best to stop smoking and stop or at least limit alcohol consumption. And as the macular degeneration continues and progresses, Vitamin supplementation with vitamins E and A are very important. Zinc supplementation is also important. And some other supplements, including cupric oxide, lutein, zeaxanthin, and omega-3 fatty acids are all important. These have all been shown to reduce the progression of dry age-related macular degeneration. And in some cases, thermal laser photocoagulation surgery may also be utilized as well. With regards to wet age-related macular degeneration, laser photocoagulation may be utilized, although this is rarely used now as the outcomes are oftentimes too poor for this to be utilized. Anti-VEGF therapy can often be employed here. So we talked about VEGF, particularly the isoform 165 that increases in levels. This causes that neovascularization we talked about before. So anti-VEGF therapy can be utilized. This is by intravitreal injection. So these anti-VEGF therapies have been utilized and these include ranibizumab, bevacizumab, and aflibercept. Oftentimes it's going to be monthly doses and monthly doses have been shown to improve visual acuity in patients on these. And then surgery may be utilized in some cases for those with submacular hemorrhage. And in these cases, intravitreal TPA with pneumatic displacement may be utilized as well. So that was a quick overview of the treatments of dry and wet macular degeneration. But I hope you found this lesson helpful. If you did, please like and subscribe for more lessons like this one. And as always, thanks so much for watching and hope to see you next time.